and welcome to the endocrinology series. So, myself Amrita Bakshi, Ramjas College, University of Delhi and in these series of endocrinology lectures, we have learned about the hormones, their mechanism of action and in the past few lectures, you have understood about each and every gland in a bit detail. In today's lecture, you are going to understand about yet another important gland which conducts various physiological functions in our body, the thyroid gland. So let us start understanding about the structure of this gland. The thyroid gland is a butterfly shaped gland which is about 30 grams in mass. Structurally it consists of two lobes depicted in the figure as left lateral lobe and the right lateral lobe. Both of these lobes are connected with each other with the help of a narrow passage called isthmus which is located on the anterior side. So this gland is present over the windpipe, the trachea which, is, which can be seen in this figure and it's just lie below the larynx. So you can see here uh, the cricoid cartilage of larynx below which this butterfly shaped gland is present. If you talk about the origin of this gland, it is derived from the endoderm of the cephalic portion of embryo's elementary canal. So at the embryonic time, the cephalic portion of the elementary canal, its endoderm give rise to this thyroid gland. Interestingly, about 50% of the glands have another additional lobe which is called as pyramidal lobe. This lobe is actually a remnant of thyroglossal duct which is found at the time of embryonic development. So when there is embryonic development, at that time this gland remains connected to the windpipe with the help of a thyroglossal duct. So, in 50% of cases, this duct remains there and it can be seen as the third lobe which lies superior to the isthmus and this is what is called as pyramidal lobe. If you want to understand this with the help of a figure, you can look here. So, these are the lobes, the left and the right lobes of the thyroid gland and on the superior side of the isthmus, you can see the another lobe named as pyramidal lobe of thyroid gland. Now why I have brought this image is basically now let us understand about the blood supply of the thyroid gland. So you can see here there are basically subclavian artery on the lower side of the gland which gives rise to the inferior thyroid artery. This takes blood supply to the thyroid gland. Also, you can see here that there is a carotid artery which branch to give rise to superior thyroid arteries and these also supply this gland. Now, if you talk about the veins, you can see that there is the inferior thyroid vein, there is middle thyroid vein and the superior thyroid vein, all of which opens into the jugular vein and they take away the blood supply from the thyroid gland. So now we are in a state to understand the histology of the gland. Whenever you will take out the section of thyroid glands, you will see several thyroid follicles which you can view here. So this entire structure is the thyroid follicle. So the entire thyroid gland is filled with these thyroid follicles. Now these follicles are lined by these cells which are called as follicular cells. So they can be very beautifully, you can see the cell membrane as well as the nucleus since this image is at 500x, you can see these cells and outside of these cells lie the basement membrane. Now outermost layer that means it is made up of basement membrane, then there are these follicular cells and on the inner side lies the lumen. So this lumen contains, you will get to know about this molecule, this is basically a glycoprotein named thyroglobulin. So the entire follicle remains filled with this thyroglobulin colloid. 
So these follicular cells, whenever they are inactive, their shape remains low cuboidal to squamous. But under the influence of TSH, that is thyroid stimulating hormone, it is observed that these cells become active and their shape changes from cuboidal to low columnar. And it is these follicular cells which you have just seen in the previous image, these follicular cells which are involved in the production of the thyroid hormones. So these follicular cells secrete thyroxine which is tetraidothyronine T4 indicating four iodine molecules that is why tetra is there tetraido and triidothyronine which is T3 which by its name indicates that it consists of three atoms of iodine. So in this figure if you see apart from these follicular cells you can also notice some other cell which lies outside the follicular cells. These are called as parafollicular or C cells. So by the name you can understand parafollicular means on the side of the follicle. So on the parafollicular side you can see some of the cells named as parafollicular cells or the C cells. So these few cells lie between the follicles and they produce yet another important hormone called calcitonin. So you will understand about this hormone shortly that it is involved in regulating calcium homeostasis when we will study about the parathyroid gland. So we will stop calcitonin right here for a while. So after understanding the structure and histology of thyroid gland, we are in a state to understand the formation, storage and how the thyroid hormones are released. So before understanding that you must know that thyroid gland is the only endocrine gland which is able to store its secretion in large quantities. So this is generally a question which you may uh, meet this question in MCQs or in uh, some of the entrance exams as well. So let us start understanding that how these thyroid hormones get synthesized. So you can look at this diagram, these yellow colored cells are the follicular cells, the thyroid follicular cells about which we have just discussed. On the upper side, the whitish color is the luminal side, so there, this is the lumen of the follicle, while this side is the basement membrane side, outer side of which lies the blood vessel. So the first step, the very first step is the trapping of the iodide. So whatever iodine we consume through our diet, that gives rise to these iodide molecules. And these iodide molecules from the blood supply enter into these follicular cells with the help of a transporter. Please note that we will discuss about this transporter in coming few slides. So with the help of a transporter, these iodide molecules get passed and enter into these follicular cells. So now these iodide molecules are there in the cytoplasm of the follicular cell. In parallel, what is happening inside the cell is the synthesis of these thyroglobulin, which I just told you that it is a glycoprotein. So it is a large glycoprotein which is like any other protein or a glycoprotein is synthesized in rough endoplasmic reticulum. So it is synthesized in this RER, gets modified in the Golgi apparatus, gets packaged into the secretory vesicles and then exocytosed into the lumen of this colloid. So these Thyroid these thyroid follicular cells are synthesizing this glycoprotein named TGB or thyroglobulin. Now what is interesting about this glycoprotein is that it contains several tyrosine amino acid residues in it. So why I am telling you about tyrosine, it holds a significance about which you will get to know shortly. 
So, by now you have understood that these iodine iodide molecules have entered into the follicular cells and the thyroglobulin has been synthesized by these cells and it has been secreted into the lumen. Now, let us understand what will happen next. So, these iodide molecules now will be oxidized. Oxidized means what? So, you can see the reaction here. Now, these iodide molecules will now get converted into the iodine molecule I2. And when this oxidation takes place, at that time, whenever this oxidation takes place, the, these iodide molecules basically crosses this epical membrane and now these iodine molecules are present in the lumen where thyroglobulin is also present. Now, this conversion or this oxidation is done with the help of thyroid peroxidase. So, the name itself is suggesting its function. So, what I am saying is that when these iodide molecules get oxidized, they pass through the membrane. Now, this iodine molecule has to bind to this thyroglobulin, but before understanding their binding, now let us first complete this, the, the understanding of these transporters. So, I have just told you that these are the follicular cells. This is the epical membrane and this is the basement membrane outside of which lies the blood supply. So, on the basement membrane lies a symporter which is called as sodium iodide symporter. So, when the iodide molecules are crossing the basement membrane along with that sodium ions are also crossing. So, there is a symporter named NIS which means sodium iodide symporter. And when this iodide is there inside the cells, the cytoplasm of the cell, now it will cross the epical membrane with the help of yet another transporter which is called as pendrin. This is very important because mutations in the gene of pendrin which is PDS gene is linked with a syndrome called as pendrid syndrome. So, you can imagine when this transporter is not there, that means no iodine would be getting oxidized and hence it will not enter into the lumen. Although you have not studied about what will happen to the iodine and to the thyroglobulin by now, but you have this idea that deficiency of iodine leads to the enlargement of thyroid gland and that is one of the characteristic of this Pendrid syndrome, wherein you will see the enlarged thyroid. Besides, there are other symptoms as well like hearing loss is also observed in Pendred syndrome. So, I hope this is clear that these two transporters are there which are helping in the transport of iodide ions from blood to the cytoplasm of the follicular cell that is NIS sodium iodide symporter and then there is another transporter named Pendrin which will help and is present on the apical surface of the cell which will help in the transport of these iodide into the, into the lumen. Now, let us understand what will happen next. So, in the lumen we have iodine with us, we have thyroglobulin. Now, what will happen that the tyrosine residues of the thyroglobulin, they will become iodinated. That means, now the iodine molecules will bind to the tyrosine residues of the thyroglobulin. I hope you remember that I have just told you that in the thyroglobulin, there are several tyrosine residues and I have told you that there is a significance of these tyrosine residues. Now, what is the significance? That these iodine molecules will bind to the tyrosine. Now, here something is very interesting. Now, what happens is, if there is binding of just one iodine with the tyrosine residue of the thyroglobulin, then it will give rise to T1. What is this T1? It is monoidotyrosine, T1. But if there is binding of second iodine, it gives rise to diidotyrosine, T2. You have heard about T3 and T4, but you have not heard about T1 and T2. So, you must know 
the significance of formation of T1 and T2 because if these are not formed there will be no formation of your thyroid hormones. So, I hope it is clear that if one iodine binds with the tyrosine of thyroglobulin it is it will form T1 while binding of another iodine gives rise to T2 which can be seen here. So, this is a tyrosine molecule if there is binding of one iodine and if there is binding of two iodines. So, this is basically a structure of 3, 5 diiodotyrosine. So, I hope you all know 3, this is first carbon, second, third, fourth and fifth, 3, 5 diiodotyrosine. So, once this diiodotyrosine is there, now what will happen next? There will be now coupling of these T1 with T2 or T2 and T2 molecules. So, now it is very obvious if two T2 molecules join with each other. So, please look at this figure. If you see the joining of two T2 molecules, it will give rise to T4 because there are four iodine molecules. This is what is thyroxine and alanine gets removed out. This will be separated out. So, there will be bond formation between these two T2 molecules. This will give rise to thyroxine. Now, I have, although I have not shown here in this slide the formation of T3, but it is very obvious for you to understand that if one T1 will bind with the T2, then it will give rise to T3. So, two T2 join to give rise to T4, while one T1 and T2 will join to give rise to T3. So, once these uh, T2, uh, once these T3 and T4 are formed, you can see here in this figure, T3 and T4 are formed here. Now, what happens is this structure, this is what is now referred to as a colloid. So, it is a glycoprotein to which is bound these hormones. So, these are what are called as colloids. Now, these colloids are pinocytosed inside these follicular cells. So, you can see this that these colloids will be now pinocytosed and now they will enter into these cells and they will fuse with the lysosomes. So, they will fuse with the lysosomes and you are aware that there are digestive enzymes in the lysosomes. So, these digestive enzymes will now break the thyroglobulin and this will give, this will free the T3 and T4. So, now T3 and T4 are free and they will enter into the bloodstream. Now, the thing is, if you could recall the previous lectures, I have told you that these three thyrox thyroxine molecules, these are lipid soluble, these thyroxine hormone is lipid soluble. So, it is very obvious that it cannot easily get merged with water and the blood is mostly water. So, it has to bind to some of the molecules which will uh, help in its transport. So, these T3 and T4 molecules being lipid soluble, they will diffuse through this plasma membrane and will enter into the blood, but in the blood they will require the thyroxine binding globulins. So, there are these thyroxine binding globulins to which more than 99 percent of T3 and T4 will bind and these TBGs that is thyroxine binding globulins help in the transport of these hormones. So, this is how these hormones are synthesized and released into the blood circulation. But there are certain facts about which you should know that T4 is secreted in greater quantity than T3, but T3 is more potent. So, what happens is when T4 enters into the cell, most of it gets converted into T3. Now, you must be wondering what is this? Why is T4 forming then? But two T2 molecules combine and give rise to T4, but when T4 goes and reaches to the cells of the body, it gets converted, most of the T4 gets converted into T3. So, that means now one iodine has to be removed off. So, what comes into the picture now? The role of deiodinases. So, there are another set of enzymes called as deiodinases which will remove the iodine molecule and this will help in the conversion of T4 into T3. So, this is something very important again. This uh, slide is showing deiodination. So, you can see here 
that if there is deiodination or removal of iodine from the outer ring of the T4, it will give rise to T3 and this action is done with the help of the enzyme type 1 or type 2 deiodinases. So, where would these enzymes be found if I ask you? So, it is very obvious that these enzymes would be there in the target cells. So, the cells contain these enzymes and will remove one iodine from the outer ring of T4 which will give rise to the T3 and that is the active form of T, uh, thyroid hormone. Now, there is another important aspect that if deiodination occurs from the inner ring of T4 and that is done by another set of enzyme T type 1 or type 3 deiodinase. In that case, in that case reverse T3 is formed which is inactive form of thyroid. So, this is very important that which hormone is present at which target cell and there is significance of both active as well as inactive T3. So, in this figure you can see that the entire structural formulae of thyroid hormones have been shown for your understanding. So, you can see here there is T4. In this figure, you can see that there is deiodination from the outer ring which is giving rise to the active form of T3 while in this case, there is deiodination from the inner ring of T4. This gives rise to the inactive form of T3. Alright, so this entire slide is re-emphasizing with the structure that there was tyrosine bound to the thyroglobulin forming T1, then there is formation of T2, then if T1 binds with T2 that forms T3 and then if T2 and T2 combines that will give rise to T4 and T4 can also give rise to T3. So, if this part is clear, now you can understand about the actions of thyroid hormones. So, here you can see that T3 is entering the target cell. So, this is the target cell and this is this portion is the nucleus, right? So, T3 is entering into the cell, T4 is also entering into the cell, T4 is being converted into T3, although it is iodinase, it is written over here, but it should be deiodinase. And then T3 is there, it is entering into the nuclear membrane, it is passing the nuclear membrane and entering into the nucleus. It will now bind, this hormone will bind to the thyroid hormone receptor present in the nucleus, which generally heterodimerizes with these X retinoid X receptors. So, when this heterodimer is formed, it will now bind to the DNA, that is the thyroid hormone response element. And this dimer along with the ligand, that is the hormone, will now perform gene transcription. This will give rise to the mRNAs and those mRNAs, the target mRNAs will give rise to the proteins of particular interest. And those proteins would then be involved in several other functions like growth and CNS development, cardiovascular functions and metabolic activities. So, these would be involved in uh, increasing the heart rate, increasing respiration, and in metabolism, it is observed that thyroid hormone plays significant role by increasing oxygen consumption, by uh, activating the mitochondrial activity, it increases glucose absorption, it stimulates gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, lipolysis, protein synthesis and also the basal metabolic rate. So, here after understanding the functions, basic functions of thyroid, we must know that what regulates its secretion. So, whenever the basal metabolic rate decreases or under the state of pregnancy or whenever there is increased ATP demand like cold environment is there, hypoglycemic condition is there, altitude is high, under that scenario what you will observe that thyroid hormones get synthesized. So, in this figure you can see that whenever there is a decreased level of thyroid or any of the conditions which I have just mentioned, this will go and signal the hypothalamus and will lead to the secretion of TRH that is thyroid releasing hormone or thyrotropin releasing hormone. These TRH will then enter into the 
hypophyseal portal system I hope you remember hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system we have discussed about that and this TRH will now target the thyrotropes in the anterior pituitary and lead to the production of TSH. This TSH will now go and target the thyroid follicles and signal them to produce T3 and T4 the entire process we have just discussed. So, this will help in maintaining the levels of thyroid hormones back to the normal and this will give feedback the negative feedback to TSH at the level of pituitary forming a short feedback loop and at the level of hypothalamus and inhibiting the secretion of TRH forming the long feedback loop. So, what we can understand from today's lecture is that thyroid hormones play significant role in the entire metabolic activities. It is important in protein synthesis, it is increasing basal metabolic rate, it is increasing the use of glucose, fatty acids for ATP production and is also involved in increasing lipolysis. Also, you have understood the structure of the thyroid gland. You have seen the histological features of the follicular cells of thyroid. So, if you have been now shown with the histological slide of XYZ glands, you would be able to identify that which one is of the thyroid. And you have also understood about the entire process of formation of these thyroid hormones and how they are released into the blood circulation and also you have learned that how these hormones get circulated in the body. So, apart from this, I would say that thyroid hormone plays a significant role in regulating various metabolic functions. Thank you.